Hello and welcome to Engineering Ethics at NGIT. I'm your instructor Daniel Estrada and this is the lecture video for Lesson 8 on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, these lectures introduce the readings and the theme for this lesson. You can interact with all this material on our website at canvas.ngit.edu. Alright, so this lesson we're going to talk about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Uh, the Deepwater Horizon was a deep sea drilling rig in the Gulf of Mexico operated by BP, British Petroleum, so it's sometimes called the uh, BP oil spill. Um, in 2010, uh, it, uh, uh, there was a blowout and it caused one of the worst environment, environmental disasters of all time. Uh, so this is a very interesting case study. I have a lot of material that I uh, encourage you to go through. Um, the quiz will be on the required readings for this lesson. Um, there's a lot of material here. Uh, uh, I'm going to just sort of introduce it in this lecture, um, but I encourage you to go through it in your own time uh, to put together your own perspective on the case, on what happened, on what went wrong. Uh, uh, I have some scholarly journal articles here. I have some investigative reporting. I also have a couple of uh, uh, documentary videos with interviews of some key players in, in the uh, disaster. Uh, and uh, in addition to just being an interesting case study, uh, there's, a, there's a, another motivation for this case study uh, here in Lesson 8, because in Lesson 10 and 11, you will have to do your own research project and prepare your own case study uh, uh, on a real historical case. Um, your assignments for Lessons 10 and 11 will be a little bit longer than usual and will require some library research. You'll only have to do one case study, and uh, the case study will be broken up over uh, Lessons 10 and 11. So in Lesson 10, you'll do some uh, sort of factual reporting of just what happened and who was involved and what the consequences were. Uh, and then in Lesson 11, I want you to give an ethical analysis of the case, of, of the same case. Uh, who's to blame? How do we hold them responsible? How do we prevent it from happening in the future? How do the ethical theories that we've talked about in class apply to this case? Uh, so, so you're going to have to do uh, this kind of um, write-up. Uh, it'll be a little more involved than a normal week, and you'll have to do some library research. Uh, so in order to prepare you for that, I'm mentioning it now, and I'm also preparing this Deepwater Horizon case study, which contains a lot of the kind of scholarly sources that I'll be expecting. Um, scholarly journal articles from peer-reviewed journals, um, investigative journalism, uh, uh, documentary reporting. Um, uh, this kind of stuff... Uh, is, is the sort of thing I expect of your own research on your case study. So you can use this as an example. Uh, I have the citations for all of these, uh, the full citations for all this uh, l later on in the slideshow, so you can see examples of that also. All right. Uh, so uh, I mentioned that the Deepwater Horizon oil spill is one of the worst environmental disasters in history, one of the worst oil spills in history. Uh, so just to give that a little bit of context, we can look at some other major oil spills, major disasters. Uh, in uh, 1910 to 1911, for about 18 months, uh, the Lakeview Gusher was a uh, on-ground uh, oil well that got out of control, started gushing, uh, uh, and the, the people who were responsible just sort of abandoned it. They couldn't get it out of control, so they just sort of left. Uh, the scene, um, and that gusher continued to spill oil on the ground uh, for 18 months. Uh, estimates are something like 9 million barrels, barrels, barrels of oil were spilled at this event, and it's uh, by far the worst oil spill in history. Um, a little more recently, um, and also in the Gulf of Mexico, like the Deepwater Horizon case, uh, is the Ixtoc event, which is another blowout uh, where an oil rig uh, ended up going down. Um, uh, in 1979, 1980, so for about 10 months, um, oil was spewing into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, overall, about 3 million barrels of oil were spilled into the Gulf, um, and this is a little bit less than the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, uh, more recently, still, uh, the Exxon Valdez, uh, I remember this from when I was a kid. Uh, this was not a source uh, spill from an oil well. Um, this was a tanker that was transporting oil. Um, and it was filled with about 260,000 uh, barrels of oil, uh, and it happened to hit some rocks um, near a wildlife preserve. So there's a, a sort of natural habitat uh, a wildlife preserve there. Uh, there's a, a reef in the ocean. This is outside of Alaska. Um, and uh, 250,000 barrels of oil were spilled uh, on that nature preserve. Uh, part of the problem with the Exxon Valdez, the reason it hit the rock was because the radar system was down and had been down for like a year before the, uh, this, and it had just been too expensive to fix it. So the ship was mostly traveling blind, um, and it was also sort of rushing through the job, and so they weren't taking all the precautions they needed to, they were understaffed and so on. Um, so uh, that was another major oil spill. Uh, one more uh, is worth mentioning here is the Kuwait oil fires. So you can see the 
animation there is pretty dramatic. Um, this uh, is in uh, 1991 um, after the Iraq, the first Iraq war. So if you remember from history, the first Iraq war uh, involved Iraq invading Kuwait and Kuwait is a uh, small country on the Persian Gulf and uh, does a lot of oil exporting, is friendly to the West, and especially the United States. Um, a lot of the oil exporting comes through Kuwait. Uh, so when Iraq, who is not so friendly to the West, um, when Iraq took over Kuwait or invaded Kuwait, um, the U.S. responded with the first Iraq war where we uh, uh, pushed Iraq out of Kuwait. Um, uh, most accounts of this war consider it fairly successful. It was a very short war, uh, only lasted a couple of months, um, and uh, it had a very decisive end point when we pushed Iraq out of Kuwait, the, the Iraqis retreated, um, and then the war was over. Um, but while the Iraqis were retreating, they knew that we were in Kuwait, they knew that we were there only to uh, uh, protect the oil, and so uh, mostly out of spite, uh, as the Iraqis were retreating, they opened up all their well huds, um, let the oil just spill out, and uh, set, set a lot of them on fire. So for about 11 months in 1991, uh, uh, these oil wells were just gushing oil that were just burning up um, something between four and six million barrels of oil, which is about as much as the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. But a lot of this was being burned, which was turning it into uh, uh, carbon carbon uh, gases, uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, this is a, a, a terrible environmental disaster. It wasn't the result of a mistake. This was deliberate. Um, part of the part of the difficulty here is, you know, what do you do about a big flaming oil well that's just on fire like that? Um, like how do you get it under control? Just the uh, technical challenge of getting these uh, oil wells under control. And there were just huge lakes, uh, you could see from space, um, of these, this burning oil. Uh, one of the eventual engineering solutions you can see in the bottom right here, uh, they retrofitted tanks with uh, jet engines, uh, where the jet engines would blow uh, air really quickly, and then they would spray exhaust into the jet stream, uh, and uh, it would eventually smother the, the oil fire. And uh, this is eventually what they used to put out a lot of these fires. Uh, but it took a long time, 11 months. Um, this is not an easy thing to get under control. And again, it was completely preventable. This was something that people deliberately did. Um, so we're talking about the deep water horizon. This was just in the context of those major environmental disasters, major oil spills. Um, deep water horizon oil spill is about comparable to the Iraqi I would see uh, Kuwait oil fires, about 5 million barrels, although a lot of this oil was not burned up. It was just uh, dumped into the uh, Gulf of Mexico, um, something the Gulf of Mexico has seen before, uh, as we now know. You can see the oil slick that resulted from space. About 5 million barrels um, were leaked over the span of about six months. Uh, so you can see here the uh, oil rig that's on fire. Um, what happened was a blowout, uh, and the blowout... Uh, uh, exploded on the rig. Um, 11 people died in the initial explosion. Um, the rig is designed to uh, have a crew of about 150 people or so. And 11 of them died. The rest of them were evacuated. Eventually the rig went down under the water. Um, but the, the real problem was that the oil well at the uh, ocean floor was uh, leaking oil. And uh, there was really no way to stop it. So uh, let me first just talk about the technical things of what's going on. So this is deep sea oil uh, drilling. So here's just a, uh, this is a comic from XKCD, Lakes and Oceans, to give you some perspective on uh, how extreme the engineering challenge is um, for, let me, let me go back to, oops, here we go, uh, to the browser. So, so this is just a blown up version of this. This is in uh, the uh, reading. So this is, the chart here is an accurate uh, to scale chart of the depths of different oceanic things. It goes down to 12,000 meters, which is pretty deep. Um, here on the left, you see the various lakes on planet Earth. These are all the Great Lakes, which uh, don't even go down to 1,000 meters. Um, the deepest lake, I think, is Lake Baikal, which is uh, over 1,000 meters, almost 2,000 meters deep. Um, the tallest building is the Burj Khalifa, uh, which is uh, there for reference. Um, the Lusitania, the Titanic, is down here at the ocean floor. And so the ocean floor, and you can see that that's about consistent here, is roughly around 4,000 meters um, and just for uh, just comparison's sake, you can see Deepwater Horizon uh, oil well here, but before we get there, um, uh, uh, submarines uh, usually don't go deeper than um, a few hundred, few hundred meters, so they're not even going a uh, thousand meters. Um, blue whales can go deeper and sometimes go very deep. Uh, the 
uh, Titanic is on the ocean floor at about 4,000 meters. And there are some jokes here that um, you uh, might want to just ignore. But uh, you might know that the ocean floor, the deepest point in the ocean is the Marianas Trench, which is at about uh, almost 11,000 meters. And James Cameron took a, a submersible down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench um, and then came back up. Uh, so we've actually explored it a little to, to some extent. Um, the term trench makes you think that it's like a big ravine that's straight down, but uh, one of the helpful things about this XKCD uh, graphic is that it shows you that the Marianas Trench, accurate to horizontal scale, it's really just a valley on the ocean floor. It's really just a low point. Um, it's not some big deep ravine to go down. It's just that's the lowest uh, part of the Earth uh, crust here that's covered by uh, water. So it's, it's very deep. The pressure is very high. It's difficult to get down there, but it's not particularly... Uh, 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 trench-like, I guess. Um, anyway, so uh, so this is just some perspective of how deep things get um, on the ocean floor. So the deep water rising, this deep sea drilling uh, vessel, it floats on the ocean surface, um, but it has uh, pipes that go down to the sea floor. And uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, it's not as deep as the full ocean. So the Gulf of Mexico only goes down about a thousand meters or so. Um, and at the sea floor is the oil well, and this is where the blowout preventer is. Um, and then the oil well keeps drilling down, uh, keeps drilling down, keeps drilling down to get to oil that's about twelve thousand meters deep. Um, so this is. Uh, uh, it's very, very deep. Um, this is deeper underground than planes fly over over your head. Um, it's several times deeper in the actual crust, the, the uh, Earth's surface, than it is uh, through the ocean. But uh, just the ocean depth alone is deeper than submarines can get, and it's actually pretty deep to get any uh, uh, work done at this depth. Um, uh, uh, human beings can't go down there, for instance. So when the blowout happened, um, the only uh, actual uh, engineering uh, uh, te technical work that we can do um, undersea was all done by robots. This was in 2010, so robot robotics technology wasn't so great at the time. It was there, though. Um, but it was all happening at this very deep uh, 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 un undersea drilling, and then that drilling operation is actually this very extreme drilling operation. Um, the Deepwater Horizon oil well got to oil that was about as deep as we've ever dug. The deepest uh, dug, we've ever dug is the Kola borehole. This is a Russian project. Um, it wasn't to get oil. It was just to see how deep we could get. And by the time the uh, well got about this deep, um, the drill bits couldn't go any further because they kept melting. Uh, so there's so much pressure uh, and such a great depth that this is um, about as far as we can actually dig. Um, in places on the ocean floor, the crust isn't much deeper than 12,000 meters, than uh, in five or 10,000 meters. So these are very, very deep holes. Um, this is an extreme engineering project. And you can imagine an extreme engineering project while floating on the ocean like this is very dangerous. Um, there's all sorts of risks and hazards involved. And so maybe to some extent it's not entirely surprising that, uh, let me get back into my presentation, uh, that this kind of uh, thing happens. Um, here we go. Um, that, uh, that these big disasters happen. This is, a, again, it's an extreme engineering event. So what actually happened on the Deepwater Horizon? So uh, technically what happened is it's called a blowout. Um, and so, again, a, a blowout happens when, uh, so you're drilling these big uh, 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 drill uh, wells um, and um, and you're, you're adding pipes on the top to make the drill bit go down as far as possible. And as you're drilling, uh, it's possible to run into pockets of uh, uh, pressurized gas, maybe pockets of oil. Um, and uh, that pressure can end up going back up the well uh, that you've just drilled. Um, lots of other things can happen, too. Again, this is a, it's a very difficult thing. Uh, the kinds of things that can happen is that the... Actually, let me see if the next... No. Um, let me actually go back here. Uh, in this video, I have a bunch of videos you can watch that sort of explain a little bit more about how the drilling operation works. Um, yeah, so the rig uh, digs down into the seafloor, and then uh, as the drill bit goes, um, you're creating this, uh, this cavity in the, in the rock, and sometimes the cavity uh, hits pockets of gas, and the gas uh, creates uh, pressure fluctuations. Um, or sometimes just the, the, the walls of the well uh, collapse. So there's all sorts of techniques um, before I get there. There's also techniques that the uh, drilling operation 
uh, uses in order to keep the well from collapsing. Um, one thing they do is they pump a bunch of uh, mud. Uh, they, they call it, it it's a uh, um, it's a uh, it's a stabilizing uh, fluid in order to keep the well uh, pressurized and to keep the uh, pressure fluctuations uh, stable. Um, they eventually uh, cement the well um, in order to uh, uh, line the in inside of the well so that it doesn't cave in. Um, again, this is a very involved, very uh, technically challenging project, especially to do it for uh, a few miles under underground. Um, um, so, uh, so they're the drilling is slow because you're casing and you're filling in the, the well as you go. Um, you're making sure that there's no uh, uh, blowouts that happen. Uh, but of course, uh, blowouts might still happen anyway, uh, despite your best precautions. And so the technique to uh, uh, prevent the damage from any potential blowouts is called this bl the blowout preventer. Um, you, you can maybe see on this chart that here's the blowout preventer and here's a human being for scale. So this is like a five-story tall uh, piece of equipment. It's a huge a piece of machinery, and the machinery is there precisely to uh, prevent blowouts, to prevent um, pressurized gas and oil from spilling back up the well, um, all the way up back to the uh, to the drilling rig. Um, so the uh, I'll just go through the animation here a little bit more. So the blowout preventer contains a lot of uh, structures, a lot of different. Um, uh, 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 tools for preventing the blowout, and you can see the basic tool. Oops, oops, oops! Should not have hit um, spacebar there. Uh, so you can see some of these tools here. So if if the oil is spewing back up the wellhead, um, these are these uh, these are blowout preventers uh, uh, that are meant to uh, just plug the gap here. And there are several of these, uh, and this is the sort of normal technique for preventing these blowouts. Um, if these fail, uh, there's also, if you go further down here, um, what are called shear, shear rams. Uh, down here on the bottom are the shear rams. Uh, actually, they'll be uh, better here. Here, here. here are the shear rams. So the shear rams are, if the other blowout preventers fail, then these shear rams are designed to just snap closed and pinch the whole well, well shut. Um, and there's several of these shear rams um, at the bottom uh, of the blowout preventer. You can't see it really in this picture. Yeah, these are the shear rams. Um, so there's several of these in a line, and they're designed to snap closed and pinch the wellhead off if there's a blowout. So several things went wrong um, in the blowout preventer. Um, for one thing, a lot of the wiring was just bad in the blowout preventer and just didn't work. Um, but there's supposed to be redundant uh, equipment on the blowout preventer to stop this from happening. So these two little colored uh, boxes on the side. Um, these are elect electrical equipment that is supposed to detect if any other uh, anything else bad happens, and especially if communication with the drilling rig uh, is lost. Um, and these uh, uh, these two are independent fail safes um, that have their own computer and battery power. Um, and what they're supposed to do is, if you lose communication and you're detecting a blowout, then these are supposed to trigger the shear rams um, in order to pinch off the well. So there was a blowout. Um, all of the uh, original blowout preventers failed, and the whole thing lost communication with the rig. Um, but the two fail safes weren't properly wired. Um, one of them was wired poorly in a way that drained all of its batteries. Um, and the other one was wired poorly in a way that um, caused signal communication uh, so that the uh, uh, blowout preventer, uh, so that the uh, computer didn't actually operate the way it was supposed to. Um, luckily, uh, the bad wiring um, failed in a way that allowed the second computer to work, the, the backup computer to work. And so the backup computer was actually able to trigger the shear rams. Unfortunately, there was another problem. The other problem was that um, as part of the blowout, uh, there was a, a buckling that happened in the... Uh, this is actually the next video. Or the next image shows this better. So um, once the blowout happened, um, it caused a big explosion on the rig. Um, but the blowout preventer is supposed to prevent any more uh, blowouts from or any more oil from coming up. Um, but part of the problem was that uh, as the blowout happened, it caused the pipe to buckle. Um, and when the pipe buckled, there were like uh, bends and kinks in the pipe. And because of those bending, because the pipe bent, um, it was off center in the shear rams. So when the shear ram is supposed to close, it, it's assuming that the well is right in the middle of the shear ram. And so when it closes, it pinches it off. But because the the pipe was not in the middle of the shear ram, it was off center. The shear rams didn't actually effectively 
uh, pinch off the pipe, and so the well kept uh, leaking. At this point, there was already fire on the uh, the rig, and the rig eventually goes down underwater and crashes on the bottom. Um, but the blowout preventer was just not stopping the, um, the the leak, and it continued to leak. And as I said, it continued to leak, f leak for uh, several months. Um, how many months? Six months? Five months? Six months? Um, it continued to leak from April to September. I remember April to September in 2010, um, I was teaching a philosophy of technology class, and um, every morning we'd start the class by opening up the news and paying attention to this. Uh, as I said, because it was so deep, it was only robots that could uh, actually be working at the uh, blowout preventer to try to fi fix anything, and the robots had cameras on them, and those cameras were being live streamed to the internet, so you could actually watch in real time the work being done on the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. You could watch these robots working uh, underwater. Um, it's really neat to, to watch uh, uh, live as, uh, as a class, in a technology class. Um, but as the spill kept going for weeks and then for months, um, it became clear how uh, desperate the situation was, how uh, problematic um, and how, how devastating to the environment it, it was going to be. Um, so uh, before talking more about that environmental devastation and uh, really for talking about why it took so long to cap the well, to cap the leak, um, it, it might help to give a little bit more background on this. So here's the complete uh, citation for the Ingersoll uh, article that's part of the required readings. This is a 2010 article. This is written uh, right after the blowout uh, happened and right after it started. Um, um, this is a, 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 an article for the School of Management, uh, Sloan School of Management is like a business school. Um, so this is not a technical engineering uh, a paper, and it's really looking at the ethics, the, the sort of uh, business ethics, uh, engineering ethics of the case. Um, but uh, that said, there's a lot of really good information in this paper, including background on BP's uh, history of uh, uh, regulations violations, um, and also uh, regulations violations on the Deepwater Horizon itself. The Ingersoll article also includes uh, emails from the engineers involved that uh, eventually resulted in the, in the disaster. So there's a lot of detailed information here uh, that I encourage you to look at. Um, one of the things that the Ingersoll article highlights is the uh, record of safety issues at BP. And in particular, in um, 2005, there was a big uh, refinery explosion in Texas. One of the uh, uh, oil refineries in Texas exploded. Um, it killed a bunch of people, 15 people. Um, a whole lot of people were injured. Uh, it was a, a major news story at the time. Um, it caused a, a, a huge uh, 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 profit loss to BP, $1.5 billion in financial losses um, to, uh, to pay for the environmental damage, to pay for the uh, civil lawsuits from the people who were injured or killed. And this big uh, expense um, caused uh, BP to uh, reduce their, uh, uh, um, uh, the, their attention to the safety issues. So they were uh, using less money on uh, safety measures. Uh, they were cutting uh, the, 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 the budget on safety measures, um, they were also just uh, not prioritizing it uh, generally. So because of this earlier uh, explosion, um, that was also the result of a bunch of uh, violations, um, this put BP in an even worse position to uh, keep its equipment and uh, facilities safe. So after the Texas refinery explosion, there was a track record of uh, several OSHA violations um, at BP. Um, in fact, 97% of the OSHA violations handled from 2007 to 2010 uh, in the lead up to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill were hand handled, uh, handed to two uh, BP uh, refineries. So BP has this track record of not uh, uh, being very safe, its facilities not being very safe. Uh, they're sort of under a lot of financial pressure because of these past uh, lack of safety. And this trickles out throughout the uh, company, um, and including the way that they're maintaining the Deepwater Horizon oil rig, which uh, in 2010 had been uh, in operation for about 10 years, and it had not seen dry dock. It had not done a full overhaul or repair in uh, almost that whole time, so in, in nine years. Uh, there had been numerous safety inspections of Deepwater Horizon uh, since it had been out at sea, um, and uh, those came back with lots of safety violations, um, lots of repairs that needed to be done, um, lots of uh, uh, including things that required immediate attention. Um, the, the most recent uh, inspection before it went, uh, before it exploded, before the, um, the blowout, uh, was in 2009, where, where it was claimed by the inspectors that the Deepwater Horizon would need 3,500 uh, 3, hours of repair time in order to um, get back under regulation. 
Um, but despite that inspection, uh, the Deepwater Horizon didn't stop working and it did not complete those repairs. Uh, uh, so, so these were outstanding uh, safety issues uh, from 2009 uh, that were still outstanding in 2010. Um, and uh, here you might start thinking about th things like uh, sort of the uh, moral creep that we've talked about, the, the way that, uh, especially in uh, Joya's case, where um, so sort of, sort of, uh, minor safety violations get drowned out in the more competitive, uh, uh, demanding environment uh, of the work, and so the safety uh, safety issues and ethics issues start to become low priority. And when they're low priority, uh, when management isn't ta making them high priority, um, then uh, workers tend to ignore them and uh, things start to slip away and then eventually you get these big safety uh, disasters. Um, and uh, uh, so in, in, as I said in the Ingersoll article, they have these emails from the engineers on the Deepwater Horizon who are uh, uh, at this time deciding um, how to uh, develop this well and how to continue expanding and uh, uh, making the well go deeper. Um, one of the central one of the important tools that the uh, engineers use for this oil drilling operation um, it, it are what, call, what are called centralizers. And centralizers just help make sure that the uh, pipe stays centered in the well. This is what's important uh, for the shear rams to, to be uh, properly centered. Um, but it's also important for the well to not cave in. Um, it, uh, the uh, more out of center that uh, well pipe, the, 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 the drilling pipe is, um, the more unstable the well is. So you, you need centralizers. The engineer who was um, in charge of uh, 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 modeling and figuring out how many centralizers uh, were, were needed um, sent an email right before the event. Um, and uh, so the email s talks about how um, the plan was for six centralizers. Um, but uh, when the engineer ran the models about how the project was working, uh, the model said that you need 20 centralizers, uh, the six on hand and 14 new ones. Um, you need 20 centralizers to get the uh, required um, uh, parts per uh, parts per gallon of sand. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about the technical uh, issue here. This is an engineering thing. Um, but the, the email makes clear that the engineer the engineers' models, when they actually uh, crunch the numbers, that they need 20 centralizers, uh, but they only have six centralizers. Um, so the engineer says, okay, so we'll need to get those things, uh, uh, and, and sends this email off to, their, to the managers, and the managers get the email and uh, are not happy. Um, they're not happy because uh, they don't have the centralizers, they have to uh, go acquire them. Um, acquiring them uh, requires getting them from Houston, um, which will take a couple of days. Uh, and then uh, getting the centralizers and then installing them takes also uh, several hours uh, of work. Um, the Deepwater Horizon uh, costs about half a million dollars, $500,000 a day to operate. So every day that you're uh, not drilling oil is a day that uh, is, is, is a day of expenses. And so uh, all of this need for extra centralizers looks like it would take a lot, a lot of time. And uh, the managers say, um, uh, uh, they're very concerned about this, and then the other manager says, yes, this is not what I, what I was envisioning. I'll call you directly. Um, later on, uh, one of the managers overlooking this says, um, uh, uh, says, uh, who cares? It's done. End of story. So um, the, the manager here agrees that they do need a straight pipe, that they do need the centralizers. Um, it's not going to be perfect center in the hole unless they have something to centralize it. But then he says, who cares? It's done. End of story. It'll probably be fine. and We'll get a good cement job. Um, I'd rather have to squeeze than get stuck at the uh, WH. So um, the concern here is not really about money. It's not about cost. Uh, it is, it's really about time, like how long it takes. But time is money in, in, in these uh, very expensive uh, operations. So um, they're sort of indirectly worried about the cost. And the extra centralizers, even though they recognize that they're necessary, even though the model says that they're necessary, um, the, it goes against their expectations for the schedule. Um, and so they cut the corner, they decide not to get those extra centralizers, um, and they just hope it's going to be good. It pro it'll probably be fine, they say. Um, it probably wasn't fine, of course. It ends up causing the worst disaster in, uh, one of the worst environmental disasters in history. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so the, uh, uh, the centralizers were not able to centralize the pipe. Um, you end up getting the pipe buckling. You end up getting the blowout, uh, causing the explosion on the rig, um, and then the rig goes down.
Um, okay, so th like I said, the Ingersoll article has a lot of the details of the decision-making process that leads to this disaster. Um, again, there's a lot of factors involved. There's sort of safety issues, and, and we can think about how the sort of corporate attitude towards safety issues might have affected the way that they're making this decision um, in this moment. Um, we can also think about uh, whether these decisions are smart, you know, whether they should have listened to their engineers more, whether they should listen to the models more, um, even if it uh, was more expensive. Um, the... Uh, the disaster ends up costing BP uh, tens of billions of dollars in uh, settlement fees, in uh, cleanup costs, um, in fines, in government fines. Um, so uh, whatever small cost would have come from that extra time to install these centralizers is clearly outweighed by how much BP ended up paying uh, as a result of the disaster. So uh, Ingersoll article gives you some good insight into the decision-making process that leads to the disaster, but there's a lot of other factors here to consider, and you don't have to just talk about that one technical issue. So, uh, so another issue is just about the cleanup, like what, what is the response? So once the blowout happens and there's oil leaking in the ocean and it's deeper than any human can get, so how do you actually deal with it? So I have uh, one of the sources I have here is from BBC Horizons, this uh, uh, BP oil spill, The Untold Story. Um, I actually have two BP documentaries. The other one is in focus. Um, and it, it's important to understand uh, how these two documentaries are different and the different kind of perspective that they offer. So uh, the untold story here is really the untold story of BP's own perspective on the cleanup effort. So this documentary, it really focuses on the immediate aftermath aftermath of the blowout. So how did the blowout happen? And then what is the situation in the Gulf of Mexico? You know, how do we um, address that situation so the oil stops leaking? So this is a, um, uh, a very sort of intense um, technical challenge of how do you get that oil deep under the Gulf of Mexico to stop uh, leaking. Um, and part of the reason this is a technical challenge is because the, um, the people involved uh, don't have a plan for what to do in this situation. Um, there's no on the books uh, strategy for what to do in a deep sea um, spill like this. Uh, so what you have, what you end up with in the situation where there's no plan is a lot of people sort of scrambling around for uh, for some idea of what to do. Um, I don't want to I don't want to play too much of this documentary because uh, it's copyrighted and. Uh, it'll, my video will get pulled off of YouTube if I show too much of it. But, uh, but uh, among the things that it shows is uh, this guy who's a, uh, I, th I think this is Pat Campbell, um, but he's, he's someone who's an expert in oil spills. Um, he worked on the Ixtoc event uh, in 1980 um, that we saw. So he's had experience working in oil spills in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I think he was also called into the uh, Iraq, uh, the Kuwait oil fires. Um, so he has a lot of experience in these in intense uh, sort of oil spills. Um, and uh, he was brought in to try to figure out something. Um, there are a couple of other uh, engineers and so on. Uh, another thing that's in this documentary is um, the uh, CEO of BP and some of the lead technicians who were in charge of the cleanup effort from BP's end. So these are high ranked officials in that corporation. And in order to get access to interview those people and follow them around with the camera, um, you can't be too critical of their job. So this documentary, it really doesn't have any criticisms of BP, of any of their responsibility before the disaster, um, or of uh, any of their uh, engineers' responsibility for making that disaster actually happen. There's almost no uh, finger pointing in this video, um, at, at BP especially. Um, Instead, it's all about that immediate aftermath cleanup, um, which is where BP sort of you know comes in with all of their um, uh, sort of uh, money and corporate uh, resources um, in order to uh, try to save a disaster. And so uh, from that perspective, they look a little bit heroic even. Um, and it's that uh, uh, narrative of heroism that uh, uh, is what motivates the um, CEOs and the these key engineers to, uh, to agree to be interviewed and followed around for this documentary. In other words, this, is a, this, this documentary is very friendly to BP. I think it's nevertheless a good documentary to watch because it shows a lot of the technical uh, issues in the response. Um, it also gets interviews with some of the key players. They're friendly interviews, but you can actually see um, how they're thinking about some of these um, issues. So I think this, it's important. Uh, I think this is a good documentary to watch to get uh, this perspective, um, as long as you're aware that this is the bias of the perspective. And I try to balance that out with this second uh, video, which is titled Profit Pollution and Deception. This is also a BBC video.
Um, so it's the same organization generally uh, that is making these documentaries. But this one is all about uh, BP's responsibility uh, for the disaster, um, and especially BP's responsibility for the cleanup effort. Um, so um, before I get to this, let me let me just talk a little bit more about this cleanup effort. Um, and I want to point you to a couple of other things that happened in this documentary. Um, yeah, so this is, this is the COO, Chief Operating Officer, um, that they follow around for a while. Okay, so there's this... Uh, so there's this well leaking underneath uh, the ocean, and what do you do about it? How do you stop it? Um, there's no plan. Uh, this, is, this is what I want. So uh, there's no plan. Again, I don't want to show too much of it because I don't want it copyright to take this video down. But uh, they don't have any plan on the books. Um, so uh, um, And when they send their robots down there, it becomes clear that the blowout preventer is just leaking from all sorts of positions. Um, and also the, the pipe uh, that is collapsed on the bottom of the seafloor is also leaking oil all over the place. Um, so so the, there's not a really easy way of containing the oil spill. So their uh, first idea, um, and this comes about a month into the, you know, a few weeks into the um, cleanup effort, their first idea it was called the Top Hat. And the Top Hat is this big container. Um, it's a big, uh, yeah, you can see what the container looks like here. Um, uh, it's, it's just a big metal um, container, uh, and the idea is, yeah, it's, 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 ooh, ah, dang it, I didn't want to do that. Come back to 22, 23, yeah. So it's this big drilling con container, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's huge, It and it's designed to fit over the blowout preventer. Um, so the idea is that uh, uh, this big hollow metal container and you just drop it on top of the blowout preventer and it's big enough to contain the whole blowout preventer inside of it and then this is something that we can contain so you can seal this thing up and you set it over the blowout preventer and so the blowout preventer inside is, is sealed and then the whole well is, is capped off. So this is their idea. Uh, again, but this wasn't a, a plan that they had on the books so they had to come up with this plan and how to do it. Um, once they had the plan, they had to find the equipment uh, to be uh, to be used for it. They didn't have one of these sitting around. And then they had to sort of uh, fit it to be usable at those pressures and temperatures at the, at the bottom of the seafloor. So all of that work took a while to, to build this uh, the top hat um, in, into uh, a usable device. Um, so, it, it, so it's about a month or so into the spill that they finally try to drop this thing on the blowout preventer, and it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work. Uh, it turns out that when they're dropping this down, as the oil's leaking into the container, into the top hat, um, it starts to crystallize. Um, the temperatures are so high that the uh, oil um, freezes. Some of it starts crystallizing. Uh, the, some of the oil, uh, the molecules in the oil starts crystallizing. And the top hat, as you're dropping down, uh, starts to fill with these crystals. So that by the time it gets to the blowout preventer on the seafloor, um, there's no room for the blowout preventer to actually fit inside the, the thing. Uh, it doesn't actually fit over it anymore. Um, and so it, it won't actually cap the wellhead. So they're about a month or two into the uh, to the disaster relief effort, and it turns out that the the technique that they were trying fails. It just doesn't work. Um, at this point, they're pretty desperate. At this point, they start uh, coming up with desperate ideas. One of the people in this documentary suggests that uh, one of the ideas that was actually floated at the time was possibly setting off nuclear bombs on the seafloor in order to kick up enough dust to cover over the wellhead again. Um, they didn't do this. Um, it's probably a good thing they didn't do this, uh, but it's the kind of thing that they were thinking because they were so desperate for a solution. Um, um, so you see in this documentary sort of how they deal with this, how they deal with the failures. Um, eventually, they are able to get it capped uh, in in September of 2010. Um, they eventually have a, a different uh, solution, and part of the solution it's it's another top hat kind of uh, solution. But uh, they inject the container um, with these anti um, uh, with, with a chemical that prevents the crystals from forming. Um, so it's sort of the it's sort of a guided top hat. Eventually, this works, and eventually they uh, declare the the. Uh, well uh, capped in September of 2010 um, after leaking about uh, 5 million barrels of oil. So uh, this first documentary shows you some of that uh, initial disaster response. Um, 
what this documentary shows you is the relief effort afterwards. So um, part of what happens is they interview some of the um, some of the people who were on the Deepwater Horizon at the time. So this is one of the chief mechanics um, who obviously survived, but he was injured um, and he was taken to the hospital immediately afterwards. And BP was not very quick in uh, distributing funds to help the people who were hurt. Um, in fact, uh, uh, BP sort of... Uh, um, uh, was no, just was, wasn't very supportive of its uh, of its crew. Uh, wanted to blame the crew. Wanted to not take responsibility because you know, because uh, the the worry is that if you uh, support and uh, take care of the the workers who are injured, uh, it's a kind of admission of guilt. It's kind of admission of some culpability on deep water, on, on uh, BP's part. So in order to avoid the admission of guilt and any legal response or as little legal responsibility as possible, they were. Uh, 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 reluctant to, hesitant to, um, they sort of dragged their feet on supporting the, the workers who were on their rig and uh, were injured. Um, and so this documentary talks talks to those workers, talks to the trouble they were ha having um, uh, with their medical insurance. Um, it also talks to some of the lawyers who are working on this, um, including uh, uh, Hook, who is one of the um, readings that we're going to we're going to look at in just a few minutes. Um, he's also interviewed in, in this documentary. Um, additionally, and one of the main uh, subjects of this documentary is the cleanup effort afterwards. So not just how do you deal with the oil spill, but how do you deal with all the oil um, on the uh, ocean um, and all of the environmental damage that it's causing, um, all the sea life that it's uh, killing, and especially the local uh, communities who depend on the Gulf uh, in a variety of ways, uh, tourism, uh, but also uh, for food. Um, the Gulf of Mexico uh, around Louisiana, where the oil spill happened, is also there's uh, lots of shrimping, uh, shrimping communities, uh, fishing communities, um, so seafood communities, and that's their food that just got poisoned in the ocean. Um, and so, what happens to all these communities? What happens to all the uh, uh, jobs that these people uh, depended on for their livelihood? Um, so, this documentary also talks to these people, the impact, not just the environmental impact, but the impact on the local communities, the local economy. Um, this is part of what BP was responsible for. Um, uh, uh, finally, and, and maybe the most disturbing part of this documentary is they talk about core exit. Um, core exit, so uh, uh, you can see the oil slicks from space. Um, you can see the oil sort of floating. Oil and water don't mix very well, so you can see the oil slicks uh, on top of the water. And uh, not only, the oil slicks on top of the water aren't particularly dangerous in an environmental sense. Uh, compared to all the other dangerous stuff that's going on, but it looks bad. Um, you know, the media flies their helicopters over and they can take pictures of all this oil, and it's just a constant reminder of the um, the damage that that's caused. And so, in order to deal with these oil slicks, in order to deal with the oil, but also the, the oil slick on the surface, um, BP used this uh, chemical called Corexit. So, Cor Corexit it's a it's a binding agent. Um, the idea is that uh, the oil molecules bind to the Corexit. Um, and then when they bind to the core exit, it, uh, uh, the full bounded molecule sinks to the ocean floor and then gets out of the uh, ecosystem, the idea is. And what really matters here is that it, it gets off the surface of the ocean. So yeah, here, here's the little animation of the core exit um, molecule. So the, the, the real point, so you, you saw the planes flying overhead and dumping the core exit on the surface. And the point is just to get the oil off the surface. Um, uh, BP dumped millions of barrels of core exit on the surface of the ocean um, and also injected uh, a few million more barrels of core exit at the uh, wellhead where the oil was leaking from. Um, and this was all in an attempt to get the oil to clump and uh, sort of get removed from the ecosystem. Here's the problem. Um, core exit itself is, is way more poisonous and toxic than the oil itself. Uh, it is uh, environmentally destructive. It kills all the plants and animals. Um, it's not like biodegradable, so it's not going to leave the ecosystem anytime soon. Um, it's also uh, poisonous to humans. If it gets in the food supply, um, it can cause um, uh, damages to fetus, uh, to, to, to uh, pre pregnant women in the fetus. Um, it, it, uh, it's just a, a dangerous uh, chemical. Um, it's more dangerous than the oil. Um, it was probably a bigger environmental disaster to be dumping all this core exit. Um, into the ocean. Um, Core exit is also not FDA uh, approved for these kinds of uses. Uh, in fact, the environmental, uh, the EPA and the FDA, uh, uh, not FDA, uh, the EPA, uh, EPA uh, doesn't allow the use of Core exit. Um, and um, when it found out that BP was using Core exit, um, it 
uh, wrote several letters to cease um, that this uh, chemical is not uh, an approved tool for dealing with oil spills. It's not uh, uh, safe. Uh, it's not completely studied yet, so we don't entirely know its consequences, but we know it's, it's poisonous and it's not, it's not safe for the ecosystem or for, for humans. Um, so uh, BP was told not to use this, but uh, BP used it anyway, and they used it not because it was good for the environment, but because it was good for PR. It was the kind of thing that got the oil slicks off the ocean surface so that it didn't look so bad on the cameras. And this is really the um, one of the lessons of the uh, BP disaster here is, is how far the corporations are willing to go um, against public interest, against environmental safety, um, in order to protect their own financial interests. Um, uh, so, um, um, uh, part of the reason that BP was able to do so much environmental damage and do so much to protect their own interest is because they were given almost carte blanche to do what they wanted. They were given total control of the environmental cleanup effort. So this is 2010. This is Obama. Uh, president Obama was in, was president. Um, and uh, when the BP oil spill happens, Obama uh, puts BP directly in charge of the cleanup effort, um, gives BP uh, uh, the resources of the uh, Coast Guard and other um, um, other U.S. resources to, to lead that cleanup effort. Um, and uh, using um, that authority, um, BP was able to do things like close down beaches so that they could do cleanup efforts um, outside, of the, uh, outside of the site of reporting or even the local communities. They weren't able to see the kind of cleaning that was, that was being done. Um, they did all this core exit stuff, and no one stopped them from doing it, um, and that was also um, really bad. Um, um, so uh, the other resources I, hear, I've hear, I have uh, for this lesson go into um, some, not just the technical details of what happened in the uh, disaster, but all of the uh, environmental consequences, all of the regulatory uh, uh, results, and so on. Um, this is an article from Naomi Klein in The Guardian, uh, where she goes to... Um, where she goes to the uh, shrimping communities in the Gulf of Mexico and asks them um, how they feel about the way that uh, the Obama administration and also the way that BP is engaging with them. And you see a lot of complaints here. Um, a lot of uh, uh, very pe people who are very angry at the way that BP is handling the, the cleanup effort. Um, there's also a couple of really strong criticisms of Obama's uh, efforts, um, especially Obama giving BP uh, total control of the cleanup effort. And uh, the article makes clear how much uh, the oil industry, how much BP had influence over uh, the way that the politicians and the way the regulators, who are supposed to you know, make sure that these te technologies are being kept safe, um, how, how much they're just bought, bought and paid for by, by lobbyists. So just a few weeks, just three weeks before the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, um, you might remember um, from Obama... Uh, in 2012, uh, but also in 2010, uh, the, the 20, I'm sorry, the 2010 and the 2012, I'm sorry, the 2008 and the 2012 election, uh, there was a lot of uh, concern about rising oil prices. In 2008, there was a financial crisis, and so uh, the economic concerns were a, a high priority, and um, uh, oil prices were also of high priority, especially in 2012, the Republican um, uh, one of the Republican talking points was drill, baby, drill. This is um, Sarah Palin advocating drill, baby, drill. And the idea was that uh, we should open up dr drilling operations, uh, more drilling operations in the Gulf Coast, um, more drilling operations in protected uh, uh, wildlife preserves um, in order to drive down the cost of oil uh, in order to help the economy. Um, so the pressure to drill, to, uh, to, to, to expand the drilling operations um, in order to get us off foreign oil and to uh, use more domestic oil. Um, this was part of the Republican talking points, and um, it was a co sort of constant refrain from the, the right wing. And uh, Obama, instead of uh, combating this and trying to resist uh, the, um, the conservative talking points, um, he, uh, he adopts them himself. Uh, Obama also has a sort of aggressive uh, expan expansion policy to the drilling operations. And again, just three weeks before the Deepwater Horizon blows up, uh, Obama gives a speech where he 
uh, says that, where he announces that he's going to expand previously protected parts of the country to offer drilling, um, including uh, sort of wildlife preserves and so on. Um, and Obama says in this speech that the risky is not as that the practice is not as risky as he thought. He says oil rigs uh, generally don't cause spills; they're technologically very advanced. Uh, Obama says that oil rigs don't cause spills; they're very advanced. Three weeks before the largest oil spill in history. Um, this is the kind of um, this is the kind of uh, a political and regulatory environment that the oil industry is engaging, uh, which is which is just not a very strong regulatory environment at all. The politicians are most interested in the the economic concerns, and so when the businesses are telling them, "Hey, we don't want regulations," they're they're willing to listen. And, uh, the businesses are happy because there's no regulations, and the uh, politicians are happy because they're getting lobbying money from these big corporations. Um, and the only thing that suffers are the people in the environment. Um, so uh, uh, Naomi Klein has this really great passage in a uh, great line in this article where she says uh, that they say Americans learn about foreign countries by bombing them. And now it seems we learn about nature's circulatory systems by poisoning them. Um, uh, we learned about how important the Gulf Coast ecosystem is to the rest of the world. It's not just uh, sort of a local problem, but the oil in the Gulf Coast has been found as far north as Greenland um, and all up and down the east, eastern uh, coast of the United States. Um, we've seen oil from the Gulf Coast oil spill. Um, so uh, this is, a, this is a, a global environmental disaster. There's a hole in the world, um, as Naomi Klein says. Um, and uh, there's... Uh, the, the regulatory pressure to prevent these kinds of things from happening is not is not is just not very strong. So that, that's a good uh, resource um, to give a kind of human perspective, especially the perspective of the communities on the ground being affected by these disasters. Um, uh, this uh, article from um, Oliver Hook, uh, who is interviewed in the Deception uh, BBC documentary, um, here talks about the legal and regulatory environment in which this happens, and especially the lobbying effort that has whittled down the uh, regulatory requirements on um, deep sea drilling operations. So, so in order to conduct one of these deep sea drilling operations, like it, it's a big uh, a risky endeavor and you need permits, you need uh, approval from the appropriate regulatory bodies, the EPA. Um, uh, uh, Bessie is also one of these um, uh, regulatory oversight uh, uh, organizations. So you, you need to apply for a permit, and that permit needs to be granted by one of these regulatory uh, uh, organizations. And as usually, usually as part of the permit application process, the company that's uh, conducting one of these operations um, has to talk about uh, what they do in case of uh, disaster. Um, and for the longest time, the EPA regulations required um, not just to talk about what the company uh, can do, but to talk about the, talk about uh, what it called the worst case scenario. So uh, again, this is part of the permit application process. The company had to have as part of that uh, permit, uh, as part of the application, um, some discussion of what the re worst case resources uh, were. So if a bunch of things go wrong, if everything that can go wrong does go wrong, uh, what resources does the company have available to address those disasters? Like what uh, what could happen? Um, what do those disasters look like? Um, what resources, both financial and technical, do does the company have on hand in order to address those disasters were they to occur? So this worst case scenario um, discussion was part of the permit application process for the longest time uh, in the EPA. Um, but businesses didn't like the worst case scenario analysis because it makes them talk about the company in the worst light possible. Um, you know, uh, the, the businesses we're worried, like, you know, what, what really counts as worst case? Like, all, all sorts of things can happen that are bad, like a, you know, a meteor can strike the Earth. Who, who knows what can happen? Lots of, there's lots of possibilities. So how do you know what to exactly put into the worst case scenario? Um, what businesses wanted, instead of talking about worst case, they wanted to talk about average case. Like, what's likely to happen? What are the uh, dangers that are likely to occur? And what resources do you have on hand to address these likely uh, disaster scenarios? These are the kinds of things that businesses like more because they typically have something uh, productive and positive to say. It's usually the kind of thing that they think about. If it's likely to happen, they probably thought about it before. And so they probably already have things to address those likely scenarios. And talking about what they already have on hand to address those scenarios makes the businesses look good. Uh, they would prefer this uh, average case scenario rather than the worst case scenario. And so the um, 
these different corporations have been lobbying. Um, the regulatory industries have been lobbying the uh, uh, politicians who are in charge of overseeing these regulatory industries um, for decades um, to try to whittle down these regulations to make them more business friendly, uh, to make them as as uh, as uh, as low as possible to put as, as little pressure, as, as little uh, constraint on the businesses as possible. And they were able to do this. Um, they were uh, uh, lobbyists were able to change the EPA regulation from worst case to average case. Um, so the average case, uh, according to BP, um, uh, was that they estimate something like 21,000 barrels of oil will be spilled over the next 40 years. Um, when BP is talking about its own possibilities, uh, its own tools, um, they want to make it seem as good as possible. Uh, it makes the shareholders happy. Um, so they talk about all the advanced, how safe and how unlikely it is that any of these uh, wells will spill. When they talk about these, uh, um, these estimates over the next 40 years, over the next 40 years, only 21,000 barrels will be spilled. And when control is lost, it'll only be lost for half a day. This is what they were saying. Now, this isn't the result of a huge amount of research into the safety. Um, this isn't a, a huge amount of research into the, uh, the, the safety protocols or how to deal with disaster. In fact, BP was spending uh, relatively little of its money on uh, safety research. Um, it was spending $20 million on safety and uh, uh, accident prevention. $20 million, I and mean, that's a lot of money, $20 million, but compared to BP's overall revenue, uh, BP uh, uh, invests... Uh, BP has a revenue of something like $300 billion, $300 billion um, in just its own research and development for new gas exploration. It invests $40 billion, $40 billion in just uh, exploration. Um, so uh, given these kinds of numbers to see that it spends $20 million, $20 million is, is change. It's, it's nothing. Um, uh, BP can uh, lose $20 million and not even notice that it was gone. Um, they're spending... Uh, several orders of magnitude more on their drilling operation. If they just spent, you know, one order of magnitude more, if they spent $200 million, that's still way less than they spend on other things. It's still uh, a tiny fraction of their overall budget. Um, uh, so the fact that they're spending so little shows that they care about the safety and accident prevention very little. It's not their primary concern. Um, they spend more money lobbying to get uh, less regulations. And that lobbying effort overplays their capacities, uh, dr dramatically overplays their capacities. Um, when the companies are not allowed, are not required to think about the worst case, when they only think about the average case, they sort of get this inflated ego. So the companies are telling themselves that there's a very low likelihood of serious environmental damage. And they tell themselves enough that they begin to believe it, and they tell the politicians the same lies. And the politicians also begin to believe it, and then you get the situation where there's just no regulatory oversight. So because there was no worst case analysis, um, there was no discussion at BP over what to do in case of a blowout preventer failure um, at the bottom of the ocean. This is why they didn't have any plans available at the start, which is why they had to go through several iterations of plans uh, while the disaster was happening. This is why it took 10 months. Um, it, it didn't take 10 months because, um, um, because it was such a big technical challenge. It took 10 months because no one was prepared for that technical challenge ahead of time because there was no laws requiring them to be prepared for these challenges, because those laws had all been lobbied away by the corporations. So what you're seeing here is not just an environmental disaster, but it's a regulatory disaster. It's, it's an example of where the government regulations, the policies, uh, the oversight that's meant to keep these projects safe, where that oversight, uh, the, the, the power and the influence of that oversight is, is, just, is just gone. I mean, again, this is because the politicians who are responsible for setting those regulations um, are uh, paid uh, lots and lots of money by lobbyists to, uh, uh, to, uh, to decide policy in their favor. The senator from Louisiana is sometimes called the senator from oil because they decide all of their issues on the basis of um, what's good for the energy industry, what's good for oil. So HOOC uh, is a, a legal analysis of the regulatory environment uh, that gives rise to the Deepwater Horizon blowout. Um, in this Smith et al. paper, this is an economic discussion of the economic uh, consequences. Um, the estimated total damages uh, of the BP oil spill is something like $40 billion uh, to the environment. Um, but this doesn't include um, any civil lawsuits to the communities, to the shrimping communities and so on. They're just going to sue BP. Um, that was another like $20 billion that BP ended up having to pay. Um, there were also a bunch of fines that BP was responsible for. Um, 
BP ended up uh, uh, putting out uh, billions and billions of dollars. Um, this Smith article is uh, one of the early analysis of the uh, damages, especially the damages to the environment, but also to the, the local economy. Um, uh, but this is uh, uh, only an early analysis. There have been more recent analyses um, after uh, going through the courts. Uh, you know, BP was actually uh, uh, found um, uh, negligent uh, and uh, criminally, criminally negligent in these cases. Um, and uh, so you can see if you do some research about what the actual results were for BP. Um, I will say that I, I looked at the Wikipedia page for the Deepwater Horizon disaster and uh, it looked a lot more favorable to BP than I know is actually the case from reading these articles. So I wouldn't trust the Wikipedia article so terribly much. Um, the Wikipedia article might have been written by, uh, might have been doctored by uh, uh, people who are more sympathetic to BP than the actual facts support. So I wouldn't trust the Wikipedia page entirely. I would really uh, do this additional research um, from some of these scholarly articles. Um, one last article to talk about here is the Kanapka article. Um, this is this is really an ethical analysis. So I, I've given the ethical and environmental, economic, um, and uh, sort of the community perspective um, in in these uh, in these sources. The Kanapka article. This is an ethics paper, um, and it's it's really talking about the ethical analysis. And one of the things that the Kanapka article one of the things the Kanapka article argues, and this has to go has to do with uh, our discussion of integrity in uh, virtue ethics. Um, is uh, the idea of environmental integrity. So sometimes when you see uh, the damage done by these major environmental disasters, it's put in terms of, uh, you know, f the number of fish lost or the number of, uh, you know, the number of dolphins that died, number of turtles that died. Um, and those numbers are interesting, maybe, um, and especially if you're an ecologist, you might know what those numbers mean for the, for the um, ecological web. Um, but uh, the, the raw numbers aren't really what matters. And, uh, uh, it, you would be wrong to take away from hearing those numbers that what matters is just the number of dolphins that died. Um, I mean, maybe every dolphin that dies is sad to some extent, but what's really concerning is not the sh sheer quantity of dolphins that die, but how the death of those dolphins, because the dolphins are a top predator, so how the death of those dolphins um, affects the overall ecological stability of that um, ecosystem. Um, and so this is what uh, Kanafka um, discusses in his, in his article. Um, here, it's really to give a framing of biological integrity as a fundamental a normative good, um, as an environmental good. So we're not just talking about a number of lives or sort of sheer quantity of things. We're talking about integrity as this holistic uh, measure of um, what's good for the environment or, or when the environment has been damaged. Um, so uh, uh, in the same way that I can kill, I can kill thousands of ants, and I really haven't damaged the local ecosystem of ants. I've, you know, I've, maybe I've killed that colony, but the overall ecosystem is still going to thrive. Um, uh, but maybe killing a bunch of dolphins, or maybe even just a few dolphins, is enough to disrupt the, um, the the stability of that ecosystem. So thinking about integrity as an ecological good, and especially thinking about integrity as a non-quantifiable, the kind of thing you can't put a, a good rule on. So it's sort of like this virtue ethics. Uh, it's more ambiguous. It's more holistic, but it's also important for understanding uh, what's good for the environment. And in fact, uh, biological integrity or some notion of integrity has worked its way into uh, the regulatory framework. Um, um, different regulatory uh, policies uh, concern not just um, the specific creatures that are, in, that are harmed by environmental policy, but also the biological integrity itself or the ecological integrity um, as a sort of holistic uh, norm. So if you're interested in the sort of ethical theory uh, at work here in the Deepwater Horizon case, you might look at the Kanaka article. Um, I think that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening to me talk. Um, next lesson, in lesson nine, we're going to talk about uh, climate change and geoengineering. Uh, so we'll talk not just about the environmental disasters, but the, the big environmental disaster, which is climate change, and what we can do about it, uh, whether geoengineering is ever an ethical choice. Um, so this sets us up a little bit for that discussion, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, see you all next time.